please, please, Jesus, open our hearts to what you have to say to us today. You know, may I pray? Amen. Um, so we are checking out a brand new sermon series called Summer Break. It's perfect timing. It's summer. Things are breaking. And what ends up happening is we're talking about this idea of hurts, habits, and hangups. And I don't know about you all, but I have, remember summer break with, with some good memories. Things happened. It was kind of cool. It's this moment in the year when suddenly as an adolescent, as you're growing up through high school, junior high, things like that, where everything, the pressures, all of it builds up. And then in one moment, bam, it's done. Unless you're like me, you got mostly C's or D's, and C's and D's get degrees, everybody, and you have to go to summer school because you failed something. And so what ends up happening is this breaking point, and we have our whole lives where we're on summer break, summer break, and there's different phases. So our first phase is we're kind of growing up. It's like, hey, summer break, yeah, break. Then it goes, summer break, yeah, break, and then school, summer break, yeah, and it's kind of this rotation, rotation, rotation. And then you get into the second phase, the adulting phase, the phase I'm personally in right now. I don't have any kids, but... Every time summer comes, it just gets hotter. There's no break. There's no celebratory thing. There's nothing fun that's going to happen. And so it's just kind of like, okay, whatever. It's just, yeah, we're in summer. Now the seasons change and everything just happens. And then you get to the third phase, which I have not gotten to yet, but I've heard the rumors. I've heard the terrible things when you have kids and then they go on summer break. And then you have them come home from their public school babysitting situation. And then what ends up going on is, oh, no, you have to deal with all of that and all that comes with that kind of stuff. And so we have these breaks that happen. Oh, and quick plug, if you're not sure what to do with your kid for summer break, VBS is here. VBS is coming up at the end of the month. Make sure you sign up for VBS. Literally, you can just be like, here you go. It's not babysitting. But it's a time for the kids to come on in, have a great time, fun activities, learn about God, get community with each other, and also be that community for people in our community who maybe are just kind of dropping their kids off, jumping into things here. So get your kids signed up for VBS. And if you don't have a child like myself, take a moment. You can kind of sponsor a kid very similar to the adopt a student thing that we were talking about earlier. And you can adopt uh, an activity or adopt a, a moment or something that you can help out with VBS. So it's a great, great experience. Madison's out in the lobby doing that. But take a moment to check that out. Um, but back to the idea of the summer break. We get in this whole young lives of going back and forth of break, 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 break. And then as we get older, we start to get this other season where we decide, oh, instead of a break, I'm going to do something new and better. Maybe the New Year's, right? Um, new Year's resolution. I'm going to do this thing. And I think we focus a lot on these New Year's resolutions and the new things we're going to do. But six months goes by, perfect timing, second half of the year. And there's some things that we're maybe holding on to, some things that we need to take a break from. And so that's my theory on this. This is a theory that me and Pastor Chris came up with. Is there's some things you need to take a break from and break from before you hit a breaking point. Because what's happening here is our hurts are these things that will turn into habits that will turn into hangups. And for the purpose of these series, kind of defining these terms a little bit, hurts are a pain, a frustration. It could be something as little as I don't like my job. You know, it's annoying. Oh, the boss said this and the client said this, yada, yada, yada. I have to deal with all this stuff. It could be a simple thing like that. It could be something much worse. Somebody who hurt you, somebody, somebody who did something to you. Lines, lines were crossed emotionally, physically, whatever it might be, there can be a real pain. And these pains, these frustrations, these things, these hurts that build up inside of us can take a hold. And then we go to habits, which are a coping action because we're dealing with the hurts and we're replacing this coping action with giving the hurt to God, with relying on God. We are trying to play God in that moment. And then we have the hangups. The next step after habits, when our habits start to affect others and the plan that God has for our lives. And so it goes down this path of these hurts to these habits to these hangups, and it all builds up. Let me give you a little example, a few examples that I thought of when I was doing this. Some from my personal life, some I'm just thinking about. You're tired from work. Little hurt, nothing big, just, oh, man, this was difficult. This was lame. I didn't like this. This is happening. And so to cope, you turn to the habit of playing video games. You turn to the habit of watching the sports ball game. You turn to the habit of going on YouTube, whatever. Just something to kind of like, oh, I just don't want to, I just want to zone out for a second. Everyone ever said that? I just want to zone out for a second. I just want to think about the stuff that's happening. I don't want to process the stuff that's happening. Ooh, that's something that I have dealt with. And so I turn to this habit, and the habit's a coping mechanism. Instead of giving my frustration with my work, instead of giving my frustration with my pain that I have about this thing to God, I just have a quick coping habit that takes care of it. And then from there, it becomes a hang-up. 
I become completely unaware of what's happening. If I don't get my little TV fix and watch my show and watch my little soap opera after I work, then, oh, man, I get cranky. My wife wants to talk to me, like, hey, I'm watching my show. Oh, what's going on? Kids want to talk to you. Hey, I'm focused. I'm doing my thing. This is my time. This is my time. This is my time. I just need a moment here. And this hang-up prevents you from the plan God might have for your life. Another example, maybe, maybe you... You're hurt because you, you don't feel as cool as you used to feel, or you want to feel cooler than you feel. You, you, you might not, you, you want some sort of status. You want something that makes you feel good about who you are. And maybe it's a little shiny something that makes people recognize you, makes people see you differently. And so, you know what you do? You go and buy some cool things. You go buy the new Apple Watch. You go buy the new Samsung, what not. You go buy the, the cool car, this thing, all that, all these little things. You go shop, you get the clothes, you do the stuff that just makes you feel a little bit better, a little habit that helps you cope with the pain of not feeling good enough, and that helps you feel better about who you are. But then it comes time to buy that house, and your credit score is something different. The credit cards have kept going, kept going, kept going. The debt's there, there, there. It grows, it grows, it grows, it grows, it grows, until it's something that becomes a hang-up and prevents you from the plan that God has for you. Maybe somebody left you, the hurt, the pain. You thought they were the right person didn't work out. So every time you're with a new person, you have this habit of doing anything you can to get them to stay. Anything you can to make it work. Because the hang-up you're stuck with is you don't want to feel like a failure again. But then you're in a bad place with a bad spot, with the wrong thing and the wrong person, the wrong mentality for why you're in a relationship, whether it be romantic or with something else with a friend. You just don't want to lose that connection again. Maybe life didn't go the way you planned it would go. I'll make this perfect. Maybe life didn't go the way I planned it would go. I have a job that I didn't like, or I did, uh, something happened with me. I'm frustrated because I thought I was supposed to be at point A, but I'm at point seven, and I have no idea what's going on, and I'm frustrated. I go, God, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? And so because I just want to zone out for a second, I take a little drink. A little drink. A little more. A little more. Starts to be a little problem. People start to say something. I go, okay, yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. Habit. Just to cope with the feeling of feeling like my path isn't the way I want it to be, the demand that I have, because I knew how I wanted it to go. And then I start getting into the hang-ups where I can't function. I can't interact with people properly. I can't interact with people properly unless I have that drink. I feel so socially self-conscious. I get so to the point where I lie about having it or not having it because I can't cope. I can't hang. I can't have these conversations that I need to have unless I'm calmed down a little bit and the voice of failure in my head is turned off. Now, I've celebrated five years of sobriety, but these are things that end up happening here. These are things where when you see these hurts, these pains, these things, paper cuts or full-on lobbing limbs off become habits. And then those habits develop as coping. And then we end up getting to this place where we're hung up and God's plan is not on the path it's supposed to be. God had a plan for us. He has something for us. And we're going that. So today we start this three-week series. Today we dive into this three-week series. And Pastor Chris asked me to speak in this series probably a couple months ago. He came up with the idea. We bounced some stuff off each other. And I was super fun. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm so pumped. I love talking about taking care of habits. This is going to be awesome, right? It's super exciting. Habits are so great to take care of. Habits are like cutting down weeds. You see the big plant there, and you're like, let's go. You get the weed whacker, and everything just comes falling down. You're so excited. But you know what's a lot more annoying? It's having to dig the roots up. Having to get that little tool that's like a screwdriver with a fork. What is that called? I have no idea, but we all know it. And we're trying to dig it out and get it and get it and get it. And it's so annoying. You get dirty. You get sweaty. It's not satisfying because nothing looks like it's been done. But that's what we're talking about today. The root of the problem. We're going to get more into the idea of the plant analogy next week because I get to the blessing to talk about habits. But we need to take care of this root problem of the hurt. Because if we let this snowball, the hurt become a habit, become a hang-up, if we can prevent it at the hurt stage, which is what we are all most dealing with, most of us deal with these hurts, more hurts than habits and hang-ups, because it has to roll down that path. We've got to make sure that we get out of the hurts and we dig things up. And I have a theory that I have a theory that there's two reasons why with these hurts, these habits, and these hang-ups that continue to haunt us. I think there's two reasons. We forget who we are and we try to play God. 
and we also think God's word is a suggestion rather than a set of commandments on how to live our lives. And so I wanna break down these two ideas right now. First thing we're gonna break down is we forget who we are and we try to play God. We're gonna jump into Psalms 23 right now. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to open it up. If you wanna follow along, get your Bible. We believe in the Bible here. We love the Bible here. And so we wanna jump into the word of God and read along with me as we go into it. So let's read together and read Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If God is the shepherd, who are we? The sheep. If God is the shepherd, we are the sheep. This, these verses, as we pay attention to these verses for a second, think about what it's, it's telling us about ourselves, what it's telling us about the nature of God. And so we keep going on. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, if God is the shepherd, who are we? Come on, church, you got to get this. If God is the shepherd, who are we? That is very annoying to me sometimes. I don't like to think of myself as a sheep. I'm sure we've all heard the analogy and we've talked about this idea before. If you've been in church, you've heard this, but it's very frustrating to think about that idea because I've seen what sheep are like. I've seen how they act, I've seen how they interact, and I don't like that idea because I consider myself better than that. But that's where I stop being humble and I start relying on my own strength and I start getting frustrated about what's going on. As we keep going here, I want us to ask the question, do I acknowledge that I am a sheep or am I trying to be a shepherd? Take a moment to think about that. Do we really acknowledge it? Do we live in that actual truth? Not one of truths. This is the actual truth. And in my opinion, this is one of the most important pieces of Scripture. Because if we can understand this, if we can grasp this right here, we understand the dynamic between us and God. And we can stop playing God and we can start understanding our role, where we fall in the place of the universe, and so that we can do what the Creator has asked us to do. And why would we not listen to the Creator I would not listen to somebody who did not create something if I had the other person who made it in front of me. The creator is always going to be a more expert. The creator is always going to have more expertise and be able to speak upon that. And so this explains this dynamic so perfectly. It ends up going through it. Who is God? He's the shepherd. Who are we? We're the sheep. What does he do? He leads us. What will we face? A valley. We'll face a valley. The valley is low. The valley is death. There is death in that valley. It is difficult, it is hard, it is tricky. And how will this all shake out? By the end of this, the verse tells us at the very end, I will dwell in the house of God forever. When I'm trying to play God and I'm trying to operate as him, I get in this mindset and I'm not living in reality. You see, there have been times when I've read this verse and at times when I've read this passage where I've gotten really like, mm, I don't think so. And there's times in my life when I've operated the exact opposite of this passage, even though I'm reading it over and over and over and over again. It's one of my favorite passages in Scripture. But I act completely differently. I look at this and I see, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But my response is, I am the shepherd now. I am the shepherd now. I am the one who's in charge of this. And instead of I shall not want, I have a laundry list. I have all kinds of things of needs and wants, and I'll take care of it. I'll be the one that takes care of that stuff. And as he goes on, instead of it lying down in green pastures and leading me beside still waters, I look around and go, you know what? I like this brown grass. I like this dirty water because I'm the one that got it. Thank you very much. And so I'm just going to keep going because then I'm the one who's in control right now. Instead of him restoring my soul, leading me down paths of righteousness, for his name's sake, I say, oh, I'll restore myself. 
I'm a builder. I can build things. I built that Lego set. I can build that Ikea furniture. I can restore something that's broken. I took that table I found on the side of the road and I sanded it like a big boy and I stained it and now it looks cool. So I can restore. I can build. I can change. I can create. I can do these things. I decide the path I want to take and I will decide what is righteous based upon what's good for me, not for God's name, but what I think. Even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. The rod and the staff comfort me. Life is hard. I get it. Life is hard. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. (laughs) I'm going to be okay. I'm not scared. And I keep going and going and going and saying, no, I've got it. 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 I've done it in the past. I'll push through. I'll push through. I'll push through. I am alone and no one's coming to help me. So I better just save myself. Instead of understanding that God's prepared a table for me, Prepare a table, literally a a table, a feast. Everything I could want. In the presence of my enemies, when everything around me is getting wild. All I think is I'm surrounded by this crud and these enemies and this junk that's just coming after me, coming after me, coming after me over and over again. And instead of my cup running over, I am drained. I am empty. I got nothing left. But I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to let you know that. Because the second I acknowledge that, that's the second the weakness comes out. And then I'm saying, I can't handle myself. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I guess this is how just life is. Because it's always been this way. There's always been a grind. There's always been a push. There's always been something against. And I'm going to keep doing things my way and build a foundation. The house analogy here. Houses are built on a foundation. I'm going to build a foundation on my own truth. I will decide what the truth is going to be here. I'm going to decide, and my house will be built the way I decide it's built, and I'm going to keep doing it my way because my way keeps working, and I'm going to keep doing this, and I'm going to cope. I'm going to figure it out. This hurt hasn't been taken from me, so I need to adjust because this thing is still happy. I still heard about this. I'm going to adjust and grab a habit to cope. It won't become a hang-up. I can control it because why wouldn't I think I can control it? When we hold on to these hurts that aren't ours, we end up playing God. We are stepping into the feet of the shepherd that we were never intended to be. And we need to make sure we are living in reality and that we are living in the actual truth. I can't become a rabbit. I can't be a shepherd. I can't be a woman. I can't be something I'm not. And I cannot be God. And every single time I try to play God and pretend to be something I am not, I insult the creator. Like I mentioned before, the creator absolutely constructed reality, absolutely built everything we stand upon, the breath in my lungs, everything that comes out of my mouth, and only the shepherd has the authority to command the sheep. Only the creator has the authority to command creation. We hold on to these truths that aren't ours, trying to play God. We hold on to this stuff and we try to say, no, I'm going to do it my way. And I get more and more down in a pit because I'm trying to put the puzzle pieces together. I'm trying to see if I can grab this habit to help with this and this habit to help with this and this idea to fix this thing. And then if this person did this, then I'd be able to blah, 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 and all this different stuff. And eventually it all falls. It's a burden we can't bear because I'm not God. I can't bear the weight of this world Because I'm not God. And until I acknowledge, until we acknowledge this and understand that and say, these hurts, these things that are hurting me, I'm going to give them to God. Let it go. We will always be in this disheveled, confused, frustrated state. It's like us trying to use WebMD to diagnose ourselves. (laughs) We've all done it. Oh, my wife is real good at it. And so she'll feel something and she'll think something's going on. But we are not doctors. We're not. I go to the doctor when something's wrong. I went to the dermatologist the other day. And, um, you know, there's something, a concern. You know, there's a mole. My wife looks at some side of me and she's like, you're dying. Cancer. And so... That's her expertise on WebMD. If the mole looks like this, then this, 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 therefore cancer, Cameron's dead. Thanks for coming, guys. I'll be be back in a few weeks, I think. Um, But it ends up happening where I go in there, and the doctor ends up coming to me and saying, hey, you're fine. 
That's just a, you're just a little spot. You're good, dude. You're totally fine. I'm like, okay, great. Do I take my pants off? No? Cool. See you later, man. <laughs> so it's a very quick interaction. We go, we get out, and it ends up being where when we try to pretend we're the doctor, we try to pretend we are the creator. God is the true doctor. God is the true healer. God is the creator. And when we're in the right place with that and we understand that, then the hurts become something we can push and give to God. The next reason why, again, I talked about this idea, um, pardon me, uh, is this idea is we think that God's word is a suggestion instead of a set of commandments. I said it earlier, the shepherd has the authority to command the sheep. The creator has the authority to command the creation. When I was praying about this sermon, I was thinking, okay, where am I going to go with this? What am I going to do? Where am I reading this? And I was taken to Ezekiel 37. And I want to set up this here before I read the scripture. Ezekiel is being shown a vision by God. This isn't actually happening, but he's seeing this. God is showing this to him. It's something that God wants him to see. And the vision given to him is he ends up going to a valley with a bunch of bones in it. And so he ends up going there. And I believe, personally, that this is actually taking place in the valley of the shadow of death. I believe there's probably something we're showing that, or at least there's a parallel here where we're seeing what's going on. And how do we know this is because it very precisely says in Scripture, he was in a valley and there were bones there. And bones are the shadow, the leftover of death there. That's my super deep theological studies for you guys. It says valley and bones, and now we are here. But before we head into these verses, I want to preface something with a word we're seeing here. A word we're going to see in these verses is prophecy. Nava in Hebrew. And what this means is the idea to speak or also to sing with inspiration over something. By inspiration. So you're speaking and singing by inspiration. And the inspiration is not my inspiration, the world's inspiration, my friend's inspiration, my mom's inspiration, my wife's inspiration, my dog's inspiration. This inspiration is the inspiration of God. That's the inspiration that is being spoken or sung over. So keep that in mind, Nava, to speak over something with, by inspiration. So here we go into Ezekiel uh, 37, if you guys want to follow along. Ezekiel 37, I'm starting in verse 4. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you. I will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you, and you will come to life. Repeats that again. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Two things here. What is God's response to the valley of death? His response is, speak to it. Nava. Sing over it. With inspiration. With God's authority. God is literally telling Ezekiel what to say here. Speak over it. Not to feel bad for ourselves when we're in the valley. Not to be afraid. But to prophesy. Nava over the issues in front of us with inspiration from God, pulling God's word into this moment. God promises Ezekiel something that would happen if he prophesies over these bones, right? He says, I will make breath enter you. He's speaking to the bones. I'll make breath into the bones. You will come to life. Attach flesh and tendons. Great. I will put breath into you. Mention it twice. Thanks for saying it twice. You will come to life. Cool. We get it. The bones are going to come to life. Then you will know that I am God. That's the key thing there then you will know that I am God. Proof, right? If these things happen, when these things happen, then you will know that I am God. So what happens? A plus B plus C plus B plus A equals I am God. So we continue reading on in verse 7. This is Ezekiel speaking now what he's doing. I prophesied as I was commanded. Commanded. Not because he thought it'd be a good idea not because he felt like it, not because it was convenient in that moment, because he felt like the Spirit was moving the way he commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared, and then skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. What was the formula we had before? A plus B plus C plus B plus A, I am God. If I do these things, God's, God's telling us, if I do these things, then you will know that I am God. Fail, right? Fail. God promised. God promised if you say these things, then the bones will do this, and then the bones will have breath in them, and then this will happen. And man, how often do we do that? 
How often do we go, well, God said if I pray enough, if God said I do this enough, if this happens, then this, and we try once. Maybe we try twice, maybe three times. We get all excited. We go, oh, this is going to work, this is going to work. And we're clenching our fists trying to make something happen. And we're trying our hardest to make it happen. And we go, God, you failed me. You failed me. You failed me. Because you said if I did this thing, then this. It's a bargain. We're bargaining with the creator of the universe. Are we a sheep or are we a shepherd? That's what I'm talking about. It continues on. In verse 9, God's speaking again. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood to their feet, a vast army. Stop saying, I'm going to try it. I'm going to, I will, I'll be kind of consistent and give this us up to God. God commands us to prophesy, Nava, over the issues, over the hurts before they become habits and before they become hangups. And prophesy and sing over them again and again and again and again and again. We speak and sing with inspiration from the Creator over the hurts in our life. And we remind ourselves constantly who the shepherd is. So we have two options. We can cope. We can look at our hurts and know that this cope, and we can cope with them with a habit. Just kind of get away with it a little bit. Just kind of just ugh, a little bit. And I'm not saying that some of these things are always going to be as intense as me talking about this idea of drinking and what I went through. But it can just be a little thing, little paper cuts of hurts and little responses of habits just so that we're missing, barely missing, the plan that God has for our lives. The other option is to nava. To speak and sing with inspiration, God's inspiration, over the hurts, the habits, and the hang-ups that we end up getting to and we end up being stuck with. When I was... Um, taking a moment to consider what I was going to speak about and what verses I was going to go into with all this. Um, just like I use some very intense biblical knowledge, skills, and techniques that many of you may not have heard about, I said, God, where do you want me to go? So I used something I learned um, in schooling and learned with going through stuff. And I said, God, where do I go? And I just prayed. I just prayed and went, Burp. And opened up the book, and I jumped. It popped me right to the Valley of the Bones, the, the verses I just read, the verses we still see up on the screen. And I go, wow, this is so great. This is so great. This is so great. And then I went, dang it. It's not real. It's a vision. It's really easy to just preach over a vision, right? Like, oh, it's just a vision. It's just something he saw. Nothing was actually happening to him, Right? He was just seeing some stuff, and he said, okay, God said, do this, and I do this, great. I thought, man, that, that stinks, because that would have been such a good sermon analogy. And before you guys get mad at me for just opening up the book and seeing where I go there, they casted lots to pick people, okay? And so they ended up doing some cool things in the Bible. But it was just a vision. And so I go, okay, God, Holy Spirit must have dialed the wrong, you know, frequency there. Let me pray again. Let me, like, poke around. So I just flip my Bible a couple more pages over. Now we're in reality. This is still Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, with one blow, I'm about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. The thing that makes your eyes sparkle, you know, the thing that lights up your room. Yet do not lament or weep or shed tears. He's telling you to do things. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. So God's commanding. So I spoke to people in the morning. Ezekiel went out and did his job. And in the evening, my wife died. The next morning, I did as I had been commanded. It's not just a vision that God's commanding us to speak 
this truth to Nava to prophesy over. It's reality too. He is commanding us to act in a certain way, and that can be so, so hard as someone who tries to play shepherd. I can't imagine losing my wife. I can't imagine losing a child. I can't imagine something happening to my child. And maybe some of you have had things like that happen. Maybe things, the plan of your life you had for your kid isn't playing out right. Maybe something happened and maybe they're hurt. Maybe the, the person you end up being with isn't the right thing. Something's off and you're hurt, you're hurt, you're hurt, you're hurt, you're hurt, you're hurt, you're hurt. But instead of trying to manipulate, play, move, change, operate in ways that where only we can solve it, the only option is to do what God has commanded. And God has commanded us to sing and to speak with inspiration, his inspiration, over the hurts so that we can put those hurts in their place. Because the hurts are trying to be a truth. When we speak God's truth, actual truth, over those hurts, those things become real small. And so that's what I want to encourage us to do today. Pray with me. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much, God, for speaking through me. God, thank you so much that your Holy Spirit fell here, that your love fell here, that you are here, God. God, I pray that you would not let us get into the habit of letting this all snowball down, God. That we would be inspired by you, God, today to say, you know what, I'm not just going to cope anymore. I'm going to do the difficult thing and uproot the hurts in my life. Because I, and I know, God, we know, God, that when we hold on to these roots, we let these roots stay in the ground. When we let these things stay in front of us and stay in our lives, that they are simply going to come back and grow back again. And, God, we know it's more difficult. We know it's trickier, God. We know it's harder, God. And we just want to give control to you. God, help us to remember to Nava to speak with your inspiration, to sing with your inspiration through the pain, over the pain, consistently over and over and over again. Because when we speak truth over the hurts, we realize the hurts were always a lie because you have healed us, Father. In your name I pray, amen. We're going to be transitioning into a time of communion right now. And for those of us that are believers, we take communion, what, what it signifies is Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Jesus went up on the cross, was a perfect person, went up on the cross and died for our sins so that I do not need to carry the weight of my sins and also I don't need to carry the weight of my hurts He went up on the cross and died for us. So we take the bread that represents his body and we take the juice that represents his blood and we take those in remembrance of what he did for us and realizing we can't do that thing. Just like we can't be a shepherd, we cannot forgive ourselves. In a moment, I'll release you to communion, but I... I, I, I want to acknowledge something because I think it's so difficult with these, these situations where you look at this idea of like, well, yeah, hurting's happening, hurting's happening, and, and just give it to God, give it to God, give it to God, give it to God. As we sing these songs and we're about to nava, we're literally going to sing over this with inspiration. These songs are not inspired by funsies. They're inspired by the word of God. When we sing these songs, I know for me sometimes, I sing these songs because I believe them. I believe him. I'm singing these songs because I believe him. And sometimes I need to sing these songs until I believe them. I need to prophesy over the hurt in my life until I understand and remember what God has done for me. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what hurt, habit, or hang-up is happening in your life right now. But I know that God has a solution. And his solution is his truth. And you speaking that truth over your life instead of a counterfeit truth and trying to play shepherd we are all just sheep. I'm going to be over there. 